Designing a custom lithium battery pack is a fun way to learn about electricity and engineering. Lithium batteries can be used for countless applications, including electric bikes, scooters, vehicles, backup power supplies, off-the-grid solutions, and more. I've broken this tutorial into the following sections. How a lithium battery cell works, basic electricity fundamentals, how many cells to put in a battery pack, how to join cells together, and finally, BMS charging and circuit diagrams. Don't forget to check out part one of this video series where I build the actual battery. There are countless types of lithium battery cells, but for this tutorial, I'll focus on the most popular size, the 18650. The 18650 is a type of lithium cell. The name corresponds to the size of the cell. 18 for 18 millimeters in diameter and 650 for 65 millimeters in length. Looking inside the cell, it is a long roll of sandwiched anode and cathode material insulated by a separator. There is also a lithium-based electrolyte between all layers that acts as a transporter for the lithium ions. The separator is porous enough to allow the lithium ions to pass through itself, but still insulates the anode and cathode from each other. Looking at a cross-section of an 18650 cell shows just how many layers are wrapped together. As the cell is discharged in use, lithium ions move from the anode to the cathode using the electrolyte as a transporter. This causes a charge imbalance on the cathode side, which forces electrons to move through whatever is connected in the circuit back to the anode side, powering the device. When the cell is recharged, this process is reversed and the lithium ions pass back from the cathode to the anode. This is a very deep topic, but this basic understanding is sufficient to design a battery pack. On the screen is a mechanical analogy to a water system that can help explain the electrical meaning. There are a few concepts that we need to cover to help understand what the specifications of a battery pack mean. First is voltage. This is the electrical potential, the force behind electricity. Next is amperage. This is the amount of electrons being transferred. It is the flow rate behind electricity. Resistance. This is what slows down the flow of electricity. Now what does this mean for building real life things? For electric bikes, the higher the voltage, the faster a motor will spin. Motors usually have a voltage limit for this reason. For brushless motors, the KV rating is how many RPM a motor will spin per volt applied. For example, a 10 kV motor powered with 10 volts will rotate at 100 RPM. Thinking back to the water wheel analogy above, the wheel won't spin at all unless there is a sufficient flow rate. This means the more opposition there is for the wheel to turn, the more current is needed to overcome this. Ohm's law is enough to describe all of the behavior here. Ohm's law explains how voltage, current, and resistance relate to each other. Lithium batteries are rated as follows. Size rated as diameter and length, like 18650 or 2170. Voltage. Voltage will vary according to the charge and is chemistry dependent. Current output. Maximum allowable output current without sustaining damage. Capacity. Rated in amp hours. Example, a three amp hour battery can run for three hours at one amp or one hour at three amps of output. C rating. Discharge rate with respect to capacity. The C rating is equal to the amps times the capacity. Example, a 10C battery that has a capacity of 3 amp hour can safely discharge at 10 divided by 3, which is 3.3 amps. 18650 cells generally charge up to 4.2 volts and during discharge drop to 3 volts or less. Here is a discharge graph showing the voltage over time as the battery is drained for a Samsung 30Q cell. The normal rated voltage of an 18650 cell is around the middle of this chart at 3.7 volts. So how many cells go in a battery pack? First, you need to know what voltage is needed. This is how many cells are in series. Second, you need to know what is the maximum discharge current needed. How many cells are in parallel? And third, you need to know what capacity is needed. This is again, how many cells are in parallel. Stacking cells end-to-end -end in series increases the voltage but keeps the capacity and output current the same. Stacking cells side-by-side -side in parallel increases capacity and output current but keeps the voltage the same. Let's look at an example using the Samsung 30Q cell. It has a peak voltage of 4.2 volts, a capacity of 3 amp hours, and a max current output of 15 amps. If we need to design a battery pack capable of 48 volts peak and outputting 50 amps, how many cells do we need? 12 cells in series is 50.4 volts. 
4 cells in parallel is 60 amps. So 4 cells in a parallel group and 12 parallel groups connected in series will solve for this. This is referred to as a 12S 4P, since there are 12 cells in series and each series group contains 4 cells in parallel. Here is what this looks like. Let's take a closer look at what's going on here. There are 12 groups of 4 cells joined together to make this battery. Keep in mind, as the capacity is drained, each cell will drop from 4.2 volts to 3 volts, lowering the output of the battery to 36 volts. One of the easiest ways to hold cells together in the required configuration is cell holders. They click together into just about every combination possible, and they have the perfect cutouts for bus bars. For the electrical connections, bus bars are used to join adjacent cells together to form the parallel and series groups. The best bus bars to use are made of pure nickel. I use the 8mm by 0.15mm thickness bus bars, since they fit perfectly with the plastic cell holders I talked about earlier. The two most popular ways to join the bus bar to the cell ends is either soldering or spot welding. I'd highly recommend against soldering, since it generates a large amount of heat and heat is what destroys the cells. Instead, I'd recommend using a spot welder. The spot welder works by firing short weld bursts, which causes the local material to melt and fuse together. Since it happens so fast, the heat is localized to only the weld area and does not damage the cell. Each bus bar should be welded twice to the ends of the 18650 cell. However, even though the heat generated is minimal, it is best to leave some cool down time between the welds on the same cell. Here's an example. For bus bar sizing, hardly any current flows between parallel cells. All of the current flow is in the series connection. The only time current flows between parallel cells is if one cell drains slightly faster, but it's almost immediately corrected for by the cells in the parallel group. To see how much current an 8mm by 0.15mm bus bar could withstand, I ran a few trials at different currents and measured the temperature rise. Since heat is the enemy of the lithium cell, it is best to keep the temperature rise to no more than 30 degrees Celsius. Heat is generated in the bus bar from joule heating, which comes from resistance losses. The equation for this is I squared R, which is the current squared times the resistance of the bus bar. So a small change in current can have a huge heat implications. For my battery pack, I require passing 50 amps, which will take 4 nickel strips between series connections to not overheat the system. This can be done by double stacking the bus bars to create the necessary number needed. From there, it's rinse and repeat, joining all the cells together and doubling up the series connections as needed. To protect the fancy new battery, we want to add what is known as a battery management system, a BMS. This protects the cells during charging and discharging. Earlier, I mentioned that lithium cells do not like to be drained below 3 volts, and also should not be charged over 4.2 volts. A BMS does exactly this for series connected cell groups. It makes sure that not a single cell ever goes outside the recommended voltage range, thus increasing the safety of the battery pack and also the longevity. The BMS will be specific to the number of series cells connected. Make sure you pick the right one for the battery pack you're building. A BMS works by connecting balance wires between nodes on serial connections. During charge, if the voltage on any node swings above the 4.2 volt threshold, the BMS will ensure no more power flows through this parallel cell group to avoid any damage. During discharge, if any node dips below 3 volts, or whatever the BMS is set to, then the BMS will cut power output to the entire pack to save the cells. The charger needed will depend on the amount of series connected cell groups. When searching, type in how many series cells are connected. For example, 12S charger. It doesn't matter how many parallel cells are connected in a group. You want to make sure that the charge rate doesn't exceed that of the cell. For example, in the datasheet of a Samsung 30Q cell, it specifies 1.5 amp as the normal and 4 amp as the maximum. You'll need to buy a DC barrel jack so that the battery pack can be plugged in and charged as well. Make sure the charger you buy has the same diameter. It should, as most are 2.1 millimeters in diameter. The XT line of connectors work really well for lithium battery pack outputs, since they can handle large current loads. There are three main sizes, the XT30, XT60, and XT90. The main difference is the current load they can handle. When sourced from quality suppliers, the plastic housings are made from a flame retardant and self-extinguishing nylon that is rated to 120 degrees Celsius. They're also keyed, so they can only be plugged in one way, no accidentally plugging them in backwards and getting the polarity switched. 
Simply solder your wires to the ends. I recommend sliding a bit of heat shrink over when you're done soldering to act as a bit of a strain relief. An optional but nice to have feature for a battery pack is an on-off switch. This will let you kill the power if needed. Another optional but nice to have feature is a battery level indicator. Most of them are configurable to whatever battery is connected. They just need to know how many cell groups are connected in series. The final step is to tie it all together with a system wiring diagram. For this example, I'll show a 12S 4P battery, but this could work for any S&P variation as well. You can see how all the parallel cell groups, the 1S 4P in this example, are tied together with the BMS balance lines connected to each junction. The charging port is connected before the electronic switch since we want to be able to charge the battery when it is turned off. Finally, the battery meter is on the output of the switch, so the power is only displayed when the battery is on. For the balance lines, connections to the charge port, and battery meter, wire in the 18 to 22 gauge range should work just fine since the current loads are quite a bit lower than the main output of the battery. The wiring size for the current carrying portions will depend on the maximum expected current. On screen is a chart that provides a rough guideline for the maximum of allowable current given the temperature rating of the jacket for copper wire in a 25C ambient condition. For anything portable, electric scooter, drone, etc., I'd recommend using silicone jacket cable since it's rated to 200 degrees Celsius and is highly flexible. This will let you use the lightest possible wire by allowing it to get warmer. For fixed position wiring, like backup power supplies and off-the-grid solutions, I'd recommend larger gauge wire to minimize the heat generation. Any heat generated in the cabling is system inefficiencies, and this should be avoided when mass is not important. Links for all parts and tools talked about in this video are in the description below. I also put a link to my blog where I go over a few more details about this battery design process. Don't forget to check out part 1 of this series where I build the actual battery that I talked about during this design video.